Hi, it's Dan Paul of Focus Hoops. So this is part two of our fantastic interview that we did with Paul Cantwell uh, rather too long ago. Uh, in part one, it focused on Paul's playing career. So if you've not seen that, please take the time, go and watch it. It's fascinating. Some of the stories that he tells are brilliant. Um, where we left off in part one, his playing career had come to a really abrupt end. Injuries had unfortunately forced his hand. And we kick off with Kazzy B asking a really interesting question about when did coaching become an option? When did you think that maybe that would be an avenue to stay in touch with the sport that you've grown to love and had taken you, like we say, around the world? So, again, that's with the first part. Paul, I'm sorry this took so long. I hope it's worth it. I hope people are enjoying enjoying it. Let us know what you think. Comments. Let Paul know on social media. And again, as always, please like, share and subscribe. It really does help us out with the content that we make and hopefully you guys are enjoying. That's it from me. Just a huge thank you again to you for taking the time and to you, Paul, for being a part of these videos. Really appreciate it. Take care and enjoy. wiped me out again for six months and then I was just definitely I was like listen I'm completely done and at that point I didn't know what I was going to do you know at that point when after that of coaching, were you thinking that might be a path to take or how did how did that then come about you know what I actually started to get worried because I put all my eggs in one basket not not in a not in a sense of just playing but wanting just to be in sport you know, yeah. I love sport. I love being around people. I love talking to people. I love people's stories. I think sport's amazing for everybody. I think it does great for mental health, physical health. I think it brings people together. So many diverse people together, cultures, you know, ages, you know, I think, and there's always an event for it. You know, there's always something to do around sport and that's why I love it. But now I've gone right. I'm at, you know, I was working at Oldham. I liked my youth development. I thought I was good at youth development with the kids and, 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 and doing that side of it. And I started to find my feet with coaching. But as a, as a I said, as, well, literally just as a pro, ex-pro athlete, literally a couple of months, I'm sat there going, I still need something competitive in my life. You know, I always say that comment. It's a flippant comment, but I can't come home and put Coronation Street on and be done. You know, my brain doesn't work like that. I'm like, I want to be competitive all the time. I want to... I want to be creative. I want to be breaking down games. I want to be doing so many things. And now, now, you know, my first time ever, the first, you know, month after retiring was fine because I can go see my mates through the week now. I can do things what normal humans do, you know, um, which, which, was, which was good. But after that, I was like, right, well, I finished work at five. What do I do now? Because my time's always been taken up by a routine. Now my routine's gone. And this is what I started to struggle with. I started to go, right, well, I don't know what to do anymore. And I started to really feel lost. As a, as a person, as a player, I remember a quote, which really, really stuck with me. I was, I was helping my mum um, shopping one day because she, 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 she wasn't well. I was shopping, and uh, there was someone, at, um, I think out of my year or a year above, was, oh, hey, Paul, Paul, how are you doing? Uh, blah, blah, blah. With basketball, all this. And, you know, you kind of get put on a pedestal, you know, with sport and social media and stuff. And this girl went to me, so how come you're back home now? Uh, I said, yeah, I've, I've stopped playing basketball now. She went, oh, really? Well, what are you going to do now? And I was like, uh, she was like, oh, well. And the second bit she added to it, well, you know, not everyone makes it. And then she just walked off and I was like, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> and then I realised as well, a lot of people who have been around me a long time started to not be around me anymore. You know, those phone calls stopped coming. Those texts stopped coming. You know, and then you start seeing this. Okay, well, and that was another learning experience. Again, you're going, right, well, I guess if you can't really do anything for people, this might be how it looks, you know. So big learning path for me. I've then felt a bit lost. What do I do as a player? Uh, sorry, an ex-player. What do I do as a person now? Obviously, I like my youth development, but I didn't see myself in that long term. Started then to train, do skill development with players. You know, because I still got my talent there. I felt like I could still be back on court now a little bit. I'll do a bit of coaching. And then Matt Morris got in touch. And that's when the whole America situation came about. Um, he'd spoke to me. He knew he knew, knew my passion for the game. Said, you know, I want you to come over here. We have a guy called Kareem Soshu at the time. who was supposed to be the head coach who played with Tony Parker in the national team. 
from France. You could learn off him. You know, I know you know a lot, but there's lots. I said, okay, yeah, this is an opportunity for me. Um, and it's called Combine Academy, who we were, said Magic have the links with now. With a lot of people have links. You know, I've tried to, I did a lot of recruiting over there for Combine with people in the UK to build relationships up. Um, with, you know, like Maya Scholes and stuff. I'd, I, you know, I spoke to players. I've had players from all academies when I was there. Um, and then, yeah, I went over to, to Combine Academy, which was probably the biggest eye opener. I've ever had in in the working world, as you said. <laughs> and that's in, that's in Atlanta, is it? In Combine? Yeah, okay. Atlanta. Yeah, at the time it was. Now they're just in Charlotte. Um, but yeah, we I'll, I'll run into that uh, to, to that kind of story now. Uh, moved there. It was a big move, you know. As you can imagine, there was a lot to get done. Uh, moved there, and straight away we had to get right involved uh, with the situation. I lived in. I was supposed to be a house parent. So I lived there with, you know, 10 other people, um, 10 other kids, you know. I mean, me, me, at first, I thought my job role was to monitor them, but then I realised my job role was to teach them how to cook, clean, do everything, um, you know, have this whole responsibility, um, as well as be a head coach. So we get on the floor, we're coaching. We, we have a guy called Zay Carson. He's a D1 assistant coach now with Kareem. We have a couple of other coaches. who they, they were young. They weren't great either. They weren't, if I'm honest, they weren't great coaches. Building through this program, we start off with numbers, numbers grow. We end up at 44 players. So now we've got four teams. And it's a lot of work. So we've got four teams. We've got probably 10 apartments to house them in, two, you know, our own houses. I start to see this, the enormity of this, how this works. The training we're doing, we're on the floor all the time, the strength and conditioning. I started to be, I, I was a head coach of one team. Um, Kareem, Jay and another coach, we were a team each. And then I would take the gold team every so often. Uh, Kareem, who I still talk to now, his visa didn't really pan out. He had problems with that. Um, and he he was still, the best way of putting it, he was still a player, even though he'd been retired a long time. So coaching, okay. he, did, I, I didn't, he didn't really get along with, uh, he didn't really gel at times, I felt. I felt, I felt he Because he had played Euro League and with Tony Pye, people are, he was forgetting there. a lot of the skill development work kind of at first that was my forte um and then you, you start to see the enormity of this you know I, I, suddenly i'm looking after houses i'm doing food shopping i'm coaching i'm thinking this is this is a lot now uh we're, uh, we're coaching six to eight i'm back i'm making sure the kids are doing the sats making sure the house is correct then i'm session planning again for the afternoon session then i'm home then i'm eating something hopefully getting something to eat then uh they're at the strength and condition at night time with them you're, it's a cycle, you know, uh, and you're dealing with these players. And you've got to remember, again, you've got players from Turkey, England, France, all over the world. You're trying to gel 44 of them together. It's not it's not an easy feat. And then you've got 12 of them living in the same house. And this is what I felt I felt lucky at. I've been through that in academy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now... You, I, your experience so now there. People come up to me going, he's, he's, you know, he's taking my socks. I'm going, you probably just want to get used to that. Because that's not going anywhere anytime soon. That's good. You know, uh, people going to me, you know, there's one kid who was 23, 24, quite old, you know, quite old to go to prep school. A coach knocks on my door. This is one in the morning. Story, typical story. Open the door. I'm like, what's up? He was like, do you know how to put the washing machine on? I'm like, one in the morning? You really have to do this now? Well, I need something for tomorrow. Well, you didn't think about doing that? Well, yeah, I've been napping all day. I'm like, okay, so... It, it, thing, things like that was it, it was crazy, um, and then we start you know we start to get into games, um, and this this was really really interesting for me because everyone says there's American style of playing, there's an English style of playing. So I tried to you know because I've had the Serbian coaching, the American coaching, I try, I watch with my own flair and my own thing uh, to coach in the way tactically how I want us to play, how I want us to set up. We'd split talent as well between all four teams, which look now me and Matt talking hindsight we shouldn't have done. You know, we shouldn't have done that because uh, we shouldn't have done it. We should have gone, you know, and I know it sounds not bad, but I do believe we should have. Like one uh, have yes, because um, when when you are, for your for your programs to do well, you need players to, to, to go on and play at a top mm -hmm. level. And, you know, the more you do stuff, I think top players do play well together. You know, I think there is more trust there. And yeah. um, prep, prep school is a really difficult one because people are playing there and as coaches, 
you need to make sure they're getting seen. They're all developing equally. equally. They're all playing. They're all doing that. That's hard to do whilst trying to win. Because you play against other academies and some of these American coaches. I played one team. They had 14 players. He ran five players the whole game. So you sat there. Nine of them have not touched the court. And one, one of the kids I spoke to is paying 26000 to be there. He's not touched the court. And with all, I had 12 on the team and I all 12 played. You know, yeah. and you're playing top academies. I, you know, we played Ben Simmons at Mount Verde. You're playing him and, you know, he actually, that's when he actually shot three pointers, by the way. You know, he actually did shoot the ball there. You know, against me, of course, it would be. Yeah, against my team, of course. So I think that might be the only time he shot. Um, but you're playing people like that and you're trying to get, you know, all... It's, for me, I thought that was... That's probably still my hardest thing today, trying to win games while playing... You know, I, I had a guy on my team, I had Ricardo Gadeem. You know, Josh Gadeem, he plays at Derby. I think, I, yeah. I think well, I Ricardo, he, Ricardo, his oh. younger brother, was at the academy with me. Um, I, he was on my team. He, he was really good. And we had a kid called Leo from Sweden. He played under 19s and under 21s for them. Oh, fantastic players, man. Right? But I had, I had kids. I had, um, I had two kids from Madagascar okay. who, who, who were on my team. Yeah, yeah. But their level of basketball, they had never played at a level. Yeah. And so, so this was like a big point. Like when I went to the academy, it was a you compare Leo, who's played against Spain, Italy. Yeah. These kids have probably, probably much played at probably a low national league level at best. Yeah. So now you're trying to bring them into a squad. How do they play together? How do they develop it? You know, how do you keep getting them? Because in in training, they can't guard Leo. And they can't play against Leo, for instance. You know, because they're, they're getting nothing out of it. You know, yeah. so that was really trying as a coach because um, you want your best players to keep getting better, but you need these people to get better as well. Mm. That was really, really tough to establish. And when you've got 44 players and you're trying to m monitor them all, it's tough uh, dealing with all their emotions because uh, they're away from home, they're away from families. And I'm very much a culture of pride myself, not just on basketball, like how they are as a human being, mm -hmm. you know, how they looked after, how their mental health. Physically, you know, are we having open conversations with them? And that's not them, because you say open conversations and a player will go, yeah, well, I think I should play 35 minutes. I'm going, well, that's not a good conversation we're having, are we? You know, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. Uh, and then we went into games, and then I, I realised the enormity of America, which I know sounds ironic. Second weekend, I've been given a minibus. So I'm driving on the opposite side of the road with an automatic. <laughs> With a wheel going, is 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 the keys to this minibus? Never drove a minibus, so I'm like, okay, right. I had to drive to Florida from Atlanta. It took me seven hours. I had to coach three games and drive back seven hours in the same day. In the same day. The same day. Didn't get a hotel for us, so I set off at four in the morning. I got home at four, twenty-four hour day, literally because of the stoppages and coached three games in the day as well. So one's hard enough, you know. Three, yeah. the players in your naked, and I'm driving on my own. And, and if you've been in America, the freeways they have. Yeah. They have no, 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 you know, you know, no lights. Cut, I turn off one junction, get on this freeway, 416 miles in a straight line. And I'm going, they're all asleep. I've got a playlist of nine songs being amateur hours. So I'm sat there going, oh no. And again, another experience. I'm sat there going, wow. And like Matt would say to me, listen, you, you, uh, and that year we didn't, our home gym we're supposed to have, we didn't have a home gym. So I had 55 away games. Not one home game. That's a lot so, of travelling. A, a lot of travelling. So we played a huge amount of games. No home games. The closest game to us was an hour away. We played three times. But most games were three and a half hours. By the end of it, it felt like I was just going to, you know, the Amici Centre and back by the end of it, you know, the NBC and back, you know. By the time of it, uh, because of, because of the, that kind of travel. Uh, but it, that was, there was so much learning uh, through that process. A lot of stuff I did wrong. Uh, but a lot of stuff I did right, I, I believed in the end. Um, Kareem left, Jay left. So I end up running three teams, straight for conditioning, housing, marketing, recruitment. Um, and it just became, I remember I had to have a break myself. I had to come home for three weeks just to have a break because I was that overloaded where, again, it, I think I was lucky the academy kind of set me up for this because of how bad that, uh, brutal that was. I was still managing to function, but then I could see myself getting frustrated with players. My session plans weren't as good. Um, I started stop networking with coaches. I, I, I'd gone through that. And I said to Matt, listen, I'm burning out. I need, honestly, I come home the first week, I must have slept for the whole week mm. just to get just to get myself back, you know, focused. Because uh, I felt as well, I wasn't doing the players justice now. 
you know yeah. as, as a coach as a coach I always said I've been through bad coaches and good coaches so I knew exactly how I didn't want to be you know uh, and you're only human being yourself you're 20 I was 26 years old uh, I'm still trying to learn my own things as well you know which, which, which is massive um yeah which is really really key for us uh, yeah so I went through that process and it was it, it was amazing you know but the whole journey Went to NBA games. Uh, we, had, we had, you know, Trevor Booker as well. This is another thing. Owned Combine Academy. So, right. So when we played like Atlanta, he was at Brooklyn at the time. He got us to go meet the Brooklyn players, uh, which would be great now because we've got KD, which would have been fabulous, you know, to meet now. Um, and uh, then I met a couple of other people from other academies. Uh, they were working out NBA players. Dennis Schroeder, uh, we, we got to meet. Uh, Jurkic, who was there, we got to meet. Um, so we got to be around a lot of great players, you know. And I branched out to other coaches. Uh, and they had coached against me on this, like, big prep circuit. So all along the, the East Coast. And then my, a guy who were new had phoned me and said, Junior NBA are really interested in you coming, doing some stuff. They, you know, they said you're... They call me the youngest foreign coach on the East Coast. I, I picked up a lot of wins early on. And I coached very different to these prep people, uh, coaches, very, you know, more the, uh, the European style, but I had a different approach to the game. Uh, they, I remember one coach saying to me, after the game we beat them by about 20, you're not supposed to coach like that. In, you know, we have to get up and down. You know, you, you stop and start, you change a lot of defences, a lot of offences. And I'm like, I thought that was coaching. No, you don't get it. Being from England, you just don't get it. And I was like, you know, there was a lot of a weird, a weird animosity towards us um, and the way we could kind of... But I was like, well, I'm going to, my guys are getting better. They're getting recruited. I'm going to stick to my guns. You know, that's my job. Uh, but then obviously I started to win and other coaches coached against me. You know, it was really interesting kind of our story, of my story. Got invited to the junior NBA programme, which is basically... They do it a little bit differently. So I did the under-16s and 17s group. Uh, and that was sponsored by Under Armour and Nike, one of us. Uh, and they pick the top 32 kids along the East Coast, what they believe is the top 32. So you've got kids from New York, Chicago, Atlanta, whatever it may, Boston. Um, and these are players. And one kid walked in, and I thought he was a dad. <laughs> this is how the was to it. He walked in, he was about 6'8", he was like this. Uh, he was under under 18s category. And I was like, uh, okay, who, who are you here with? And he was like, pointed at my clipboard. And I was like, he pointed at he was like, that's me. And I was like, Okay, right. Uh, are, are you sure? I was, he was like, yeah, I was like, well, you identification so I can see. And he was like a grown man. And, he was, and um, the Phoenix Suns and Atlanta Hawks and another team were in scouting him already. And this is kind of what blew my mind. So I got talking to one of the executives, like, uh, you know, one of the coaches who was part of uh, the training program. And he said, uh, like, the Atlanta Hawks start to gather on other teams start to gather information at 10 years old by the time they're 18 they've got a file like this of how many times they've moved the pets what they eat parents jobs all the games recorded so when draft night comes and these teams pick players and everyone you know the people out in the outside world go why have they chosen them it wasn't an off-the-cuff decision yeah you know there's a lot of it yeah, there's so much information. And I, again, I was a bit, I thought, oh, they've probably done the you know, due diligence on them in the last couple of years, fair enough. But the, I've seen that, you know, they have they have like, you know, strength and conditioning and their results from being 14 years old at these camps, you know. Uh, and that was good, you know. And I, I got coach, I got um, the coach of the camp there, you know, Under Armour was really impressed with, with, with kind of what I was delivering. And attention to detail, you know, that, that was the main thing. America, I said, there's quite a few American coaches like to coach a certain way. Uh, which is, you know, you kind of play quick, you play aggressive. But I was more detail-oriented, which I think at those camps in particular, they know their players can play already, I'm guessing, because they've already picked them to be there. So for me, I was like, well, why don't we just teach them something while they're here instead of just letting them play? You know, yeah. with surely. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, they, they spoke to me afterwards, really liked it. Uh, we had a good connection with the Combine Academy then. Uh, but that was just off my own cuff as well by networking with other coaches, you know, uh, speaking to them. Uh, and Atlanta's a phenomenal city. There's loads of basketball going on, loads of sports. It's a great city. Uh, and it was, you know, it was really good. And I was there. I did two years there. Um, I think I did two prep seasons and one summer. Summer's a lot different. It's a six, seven-week program where you put a team together for seven weeks and let them play AAU basketball. Mm. Uh, but I did get to meet Jim Behan, who I'm a big fan of. And uh, Roy Williams was there watching our team. Well, I didn't watch my team play. He watched... Um, who, what's he called now? Uh, Stackhouse, Jeremy Stackhouse, he had the oh. AU team. But he had it in the younger category, but we all played at the same facility. 
Um, but they're, they're, you know, that's basketball as well. And what a lot of kids don't understand as well in the UK, the enormity of it, like AAU. Some basketball is poor, but it's such... The money in it is phenomenal. Like, mm. you know, for us, uh, there's thir- there was 32 teams at our age group and there's eight age groups. Each team pays $500 to enter. So think of the money just off that. Then you have to send a booklet over about all your players. So what happens is if you're a D3 coach, the booklet is, I think, $350 for all players. D2 coach, $450. D1 coach, I don't know why it's different for pricing, because it's the same information, $750. Well, you've got to think, there were 700 coaches there. Do you think the money off the booklets? So I, I, there's a guy from coach, uh, Sean Williams or Sean McKay, ran the Atlanta one, and he does two a year, and he makes over 300000 by doing two events. So, you know, you can imagine the enormity, and these coaches yeah. fly in. Uh, and there's another interesting thing about recruitment, I see the coaches here. They have a coaching segment. So players and other parents can't go to it. All the coaches sit together. They all have these pads. And it's hilarious because you've got like Jim Behan, the top coaches. You can see them circling players who they, they're telling their assistants to go talk to at, at the right time. And you can see other people, <laughs> other coaches from D2s and D3s looking at their pad and going, right, don't ask them. Do not go towards those players. Like, and uh, <laughs> you, you can see it, you know, as you go in and, and a huge compliment. I uh, played like a 1-3-1 one, one zone. And Jim Beheim, you, you know, loves that. He's played at his Lance Syracuse. After the game, he come over, he went, you know, the team you've got, you're doing really good. And at that point, I was like, yeah, just hire me then. Please hire me. Like, you know, uh, this is how it works. Like, how, But I didn't realise the coaches can't talk to the players until Sunday night at 5pm. So you can watch them all weekend. If coaches are, are gone, I seen recruiting or talking to parents or players to get disqualified from that player. Which so they I didn't can't. know. Yeah, I didn't know that myself. Well, from 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 those tournaments anyway. So they, they sit all weekend there. And yes, a lot of the coaches go out for food and drinks afterwards. And that's where a lot of coaches start networking. Uh, but then after at five o'clock hits, the last buzzer goes. I also was Jim uh, Jim Bayhai and his staff, uh Roy Williams get up, and all of a sudden, wherever they went, all the coaches went the opposite direction. <laughs> the other coaches to like the rest of the players. Uh, because they, you know, Jim Behind, uh, I think, was recruiting a fourteen-year-old, so four years away. It's you completely know, so different, isn't it, over there? To it, and I'm just, I'm, I was, a bit, I was naive to this. I just thought, you know, the letters of intent a year, two years before. Even though I'm in a prep school, I'm sat with my coaches, we're doing stuff. You're still seeing other stuff be done, mm. you know, and you can see the pull of these big colleges. So when these kids say to me, you know, uh, you know, in in England or when I'm talking to other other players and they go I want to go there I'm going yeah it's not going to happen it's just not you know um but yeah did my two years there a lot of traveling a lot of top coaches um and then I got an offer from a D1 in Georgia uh and this was it that's what I wanted to do college coach I went there and the first question they asked me was you know what did you do your degree in so I said well I didn't get a degree I didn't finish my education I went to France did my two years there and then played professional right so you've got no degrees no well you can't coach college basketball then. so i was like what do like no we don't you're not allowed in only people who can can be fast tracked are nba players funnily enough and funny how that works <laughs> yeah they can swim. but they said what we'll do with you uh for your type of job position it's about 35 to 44 grand a year to come here it's forty thousand a year so we'll just pay for your degree and i went yeah but i have cars housing well it's up to you and i'm like well i can't do that then you're not really giving me I can't get a job because it's a full schedule you know so anyway well that's unfortunate that's it so I decided then I found a loophole in the system I don't know if it is now but it was when then I could come home nine grand a year and then go abroad and you don't you don't have to pay your degree back <laughs> after so many years that was kind of my thought process smart so I, I come home to do my degree so I went to Bolton Uni uh which which I say I come home after so I'm about I'm 27 now got home yeah 25 I went there got home 27 starting my degree and then started doing a lot of my more skill development so i'm doing my degree alongside my the pack elite skills coaching started doing that uh worked with a lot of gb players you know jamel uh kofi jordan spencer uh people like that you know uh, jack crook aaron menzes patrick whelan done a lot of work with them we traded liam mcdermott um Jaden bam now who you know do she works out with me every summer there's a lot of players who, who do work out with me started doing that one name you've not mentioned, Luke Gordos. A big Luke Gordos. The, f- the future of Welsh basketball himself. There you go. Luke Gordos, you know, is uh, 
probably the most high, probably the most high IQ player I've coached. You know, he's, you know, he's in the top three anyway. Um, his attention to detail is massive. Uh, he, and I remember him posting, he played for, for Wales up in the men's yeah. team and he, he scored a few points. I remember Pat Whelan, who I coached, had posted, because uh, he, he did certain types of footwork when he had scored and went, I know you work out with Paul Cantwell now. And he was quite, <laughs> as, a skill, as a skills coach, that's quite yeah. cool to see that. People are going, that's, that's like your that's stamp. Nice. Yeah, it's a big stamp. He was like, I know that footwork from anywhere. Um, and Luke, we, we, I still talk, I'll train Ben as well, I'll train Harry. Um, so the, the, Luke Gorris is fantastic. And I thought he was one of the best players in the country last year for his age, but you know, uh, and the, funnily enough, I spoke to Matt Morris and Matt Morris wanted to, uh, off, offered Luke a full scholarship to go combine. So he went elsewhere. He's in Massachusetts, so, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, I, I I phoned Phil, uh, phoned Matt, and said, Matt, you need to take Luke. And he was like, is Luke available this year? He was like, yeah, boom, yeah. I phoned him, Phil. Put, don't even say bye, just puts the phone down on me. <laughs> phoned Phil, and then Phil phones me about an hour and a half later going, Luke's been up, and I was like, oh. Yeah, it was my idea, Phil. I left, I'm the last one out in the corridor here. But yeah, uh, he, but I said, listen, weigh up your options. Like I always do with every player, what fits you? You know, um, and I will, we'll go into that detail with with kind of the recruitment process and what we look at doing at Magic and Mystics and what I tell players. Uh, so then, yeah, so I'm home doing my degree. Uh, Phil, me and Phil, he knows about the work I'm doing. We're talking. Then he just said to me, uh, you know, would you get in my youth development? Cool, you know, be involved in it. You've got a good reputation as in, you know, as a player, as a coach, what you've done. But I'm still kind of new on the block. Like a lot of people, because a lot of my stuff has been abroad. Yeah. So as you as you know, the UK, unless you're in the UK, especially, you know, it's getting better now, but put from five years ago beyond that, if you're not in the UK, no one really cares. Or not care enough. You know, they just go, okay, well, they don't do and never they never really had data or collected. So it's new. So uh, I've got youth development with Phil. And he just said, you know, I want my community program to to really take off. And obviously, Kaz being at Oldham, I built that youth development over yeah. there. Then he said, um, so that started off just with youth development while I'm at uni doing my own thing. And then he sat with me and went, you know, we want an under 12s academy, an under 10 academy. I said, well, no problem. I can, I can, I can, I can do that. Um, started that. And then uh, we, last year with the under 12s, we didn't lose a game. I, you know, I, the, I, the only team we were left to beat in the country was Brentford. We just couldn't get the schedule together really tell it that's a group uh, next few years I think might be one of the best if they stay together magic teams the talent level's frightening you know, so I think I saw a couple of games and the the, the yeah. girls on the team at yeah, that age incredible yeah the, yeah. The, so it, it was it was ridiculous the, the girls and the boys program is massive I was fortunate to set up the boys program because the girls program had Joe Forbrin last year Um which still now, it, 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 it's funny, he'll still treat me like I'm, I'm a player there, slot 14. Like, I'll leave my Lucas in bottle three inches to the right. He'll be like, Paul, I'm, like, I'm a coach here now, Joe. Like, you can't keep shouting at me all the time. You know, it's still still those levels. Uh, but yeah, I did do the uh, under 12s. And then he, he, he said to me, you know, once, and then he did ask me about coaching at other areas within the club, doing other things within the club. And again, I said, to be honest, I said, listen, I've got enough on my plate as it is with the unit and I can't commit to travelling and if I can't commit to something I know as a coach or a player like I said to you guys before I won't do it I just what I think it's not it's not the right thing to do um, for anything not just for money I just don't believe in it so that season I said once my degree's done we'll sit down and we'll talk the degree finished and then he said listen I want you to become the director of the girls programme you know uh, you know the way you coach the, the, the way we want to push this programme forward and you know this big big credit to, to Phil Gordas uh, our CEO you know he's is I've worked with a lot of GMs, a lot of coaches, been involved in a lot of programs. Uh, he's one of the, he's one of the best ones up there. You know, he took over three four years ago, and you know, you can always say, and this is another thing I'll come to my assistant coach as well. He, he's very similar. I, I like to work with people, persons, you know, good people. All the other stuff around that you can develop, being a good human being, and, and and having people's best interests at heart, and working collectively as a group is very very key. People don't see what Phil does. In the last three, four years, he's transformed this whole club, which I believe now we're back in the top three years. And I personally believe that. And I think we'll surprise a lot of people. And I'll go over what we're doing now. He's put everything in stone, in place. I mean, I'm talking from his, you know, you look at you look at how, uh, even even our academy stuff, the kind of stuff we wear as a group. I remember being at Magic and, you know, Mystics, playing at Magic myself. We just got given a T-shirt. Now they have everything, you know, um, how the sessions are run. Um, 
how we look as a club, our pathway from under 10s all the way up as a club uh, is phenomenal. All the small things he's changed, how we approach community, who he's brought in, um, resources, um, the stuff he's done to put in place, he's, he, he can't. And as a CEO, he's doing stuff I don't see, painting walls, you know, picking people up in a minibus to drop people off. You know, he doesn't need to do that. He's a CEO. He doesn't need to do that at all. Uh, but he puts his time, his heart, his energy, his passion into that. And for me, that's where I knew I'm always going to be. Me and him are going to always get along really, really well. And yeah. we do. We talk We talk every day. We don't, you know, now and again, you don't see eye to eye on certain things. Or you have your different views. But we, we're, we're pretty much 99% on everything together. And he has the best interest in this club and everything he does and he's I can't stress how good he is how good he has been for this club and he will be for this club and what he's really done to it and how he's changed it around the stuff we're doing and and progressing forward is phenomenal and we have a great relationship with him I'm one of them I'm still I still have that player a little bit of a player in me I don't like being micromanaged Um, my my best work is what do you want me to do Paul here you go right don't mind me it'll get done and it'll get done well you know that's kind of my approach to stuff and if it doesn't get done well I'll phone you and go I'm struggling you know, and that that I don't need that. And he and he's that's exactly how he wants his staff to be. Listen, here's your job. Go do it. If you need me, I'm here. But that uh, and then we all come together and we talk about how everything's going. You know, we check in, we do a lot with that. Uh, and it, it it's phenomenal like how we've got developed this relationship so quick. Uh and we've got the best interest uh with that. Uh so yeah, and then we so after that. He's now brought me in, director of coaching. We had a good talk about how we want this program to look, how we want it to be going forward, um, and yeah, just just how it wants to represent and, and getting it back to the top like it used to be. Um, how you know we we talked about everything. So if we start our academy this year, my role was the Division Two Women's Head Coach, WEBL and 18s. Uh, I wanted a D2 programme. Phil talked about the D2 programme. Uh, we believed, because we have the WBBL Mystics team, but there, there is a big step up from under 18 to WBBL. There's only a couple of players who can do that. And you just have to be realistic about that. You know, no matter how good you think, it is a big step up uh, with that. And also, he's not necessarily guaranteed playing minutes at that time. You know, and for me, I want that. I want to bridge the gap. So well, I wanted to go D2 this year. My idea was to get to get promoted straight away. My, 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 as a coach, and like Phil's the same, and my assistant coach, David Eckerson, we're about progress. Yeah. Always about progress. We're not, I'm not in it just to sit still. That's never happened. We're always going to be doing this. Always. Uh, so I said, well, if you give me enough resources, my goal, I'll get, I want to get us out of D2. So we go D1. Okay. Not only does that let my best to be EBL players and best under 18s players play up to play against grown women, gather experience, get better. It also then, uh, for, for us, the players who leave us. So, for instance, we've got a couple of players this year who don't want to go to the States, you know, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to. You know, there's this thing, I think, if you're at a top club, you're forced upon that, and that's something what needs addressing, I think, still. You don't, you shouldn't need all that pressure. There's a lot of good basketball over here. A ton it's of good basketball. Everyone, is it? There's been players that have gone over and come back home because it just wasn't it, for them. Exactly. And, that, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and I want them to, if they do leave Mystics or they have played somewhere else and they're coming back to Manchester, to have that connection with us as a club. You know, to, you know, if they do leave next year and they're only they're still under 19s, but the two old, the two old, we don't do third years. We do second years and we go, we don't really have a third year. We just don't, I don't think we need to. So, you know, uh, we have a person this year, like a Maddie Owen this year, who's uh, she's been fantastic for me so far. Uh, she, you know, she she wants to go somewhere like MMU, which we have a great link at. She might want to go there. She might want to go to Salford. So she's still, but she's a great basketball player and integral what we're going to be doing this year. So we want her to stick around next year. You know, be a veteran leader, help develop her communication, her leadership skills, still as a young a young adult, uh, and have that connection. And then players like that, we have uh, Ebony Horton who plays WBBL. She started coaching yeah. with me now. She she's assisting me, coming and assisting me this year. Um, again, we, we want players like that um, coming coming back or coming within Manchester where they can be part of these programmes. We can get them qualifications in coaching if they want to be in that and keep this pathway of coaches and players developing. It's a cycle all the time. You know, we're always learning off each other. Um, and then we can have, we can go WBBL. This next year it'll be D2, but hopefully it'll be D1 at some point. So WBBL, D1, uh, WEBL, under 18, 16, 14, 12, under 10s. And then we've got every single layer 
and then we can build a whole culture, a whole philosophy, as we spoke about before, straight through. You know, and, and for us, I think, I think that is one. It's really, really hard to do because obviously we, they've been great for twenty years. Magic Mr. Joe yeah. Farber, Green Williams, all the guys who've been there have been phenomenal. But like anything, times change. People over academies catch up. People grow, and there's a lot of great cultures and basketball being happening in the UK now. But we want to keep now. Okay, you're doing this. We want to go another level now. We want to make sure we're covering everything. So we have, uh, as coaches, I have David Atkinson, I said my assistant coach who won a title there, uh, I think 2000, maybe 16, when I think uh, Jess Eadsforth and Freya Kelshaw played, um, players like Harriet Swindles played there. He had won there, but he had been my under 14 same side coach, coached me at Stockport. We'd played together uh, on different teams. It, uh, then he, he went to Magic uh, Mystics, coached there, won there. Then he was at Tameside last year. Um, and a couple of years out, went to Tameside, and now I took over here. He's wanted to come back in, and he's one of those guys. He's another one like Phil. He, he's so passionate, gives everything to to the game, and I mean everything, even from the even from the time going all the way back when I played for him at Tameside at fourteen. When I said to him, "I want to go to Magic," he still he in his car would take me to the Magic train and then go to his own practice at Tameside. You know, and that's for me what a coach is above yeah. and beyond. And he still does that now. You know, he works a full-time job. I'm very lucky to be full-time paid to do what I do and what I love. Uh, he has a full-time job, you know, as a volunteer. And he's every day we're on the phone, you know. We're like, we're like, we're like a married couple. We're always on the phone, you know, going back and forth. And he's, again, you know, he's a great tactician and he cares, you know. So not only has he got his basketball experience, he's been doing it, you know, for, you know, God knows how long now. Is it 20 years? You know, something like that. You know, he's been doing it a long time. Uh, he's he's got that experience. He's got that care. He was he was a PE teacher, uh, so he understands people again, you know. Uh, and it's just great to have him on board, you know. Again, you know, he has said he's another one like Phil, like uh, and myself. We care a lot about the players. Uh, basketball is always, you know, it is part of it, but uh, we wanted to put staff together who can do a lot more. And I think we I think we're doing that this year. Um, I said our goal this year, you know, for for from an 80s and WL perspective. We want it to look super professional on and off the court. That's my my goal when I come into any program. I want it to be. I want it to look and be a certain way and have a certain feel. Secondly, um, we care massively. Well, I, as a club and as coaches, and fill the CEO all the way through. Academics is massively important for us. You know, and we'll constantly go on and that. You know, we want to make sure you're academically getting your getting yourself set up. Like I said, you can play basketball, you can make a career out of it, but you know, you start, at some point you're going to retire. You know, so are you going to do something different? So what you know, what have you got? What you can go on and do something else? What have you learned? You know, wherever you are academically, where you can push on. Uh, and also, we 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 don't try to over focus. Uh, the the uh, the training and the playing over academics. We, we don't do that at all. Uh, I I have in my programs full transparency. This year with the under 18s particularly, which we we've been doing something which I spoke to our welfare team and uh, CEO Phil and our coaching staff. We're trying to cut out um, parents uh, in particular, which you guys know our parents can be influential. Yeah. These are now young young women growing up. They have to find a voice. They have to find be able to communicate. We believe as coaches, we're, we're as transparent as, as we can be. That's our thing this year. Anything you've got, you come to us, you know, and, and we'll sit and we go through everything. And we've, we've built a great rapport with the girls. And this year has been tricky. We've had we've put three groups together, under-16s two, under-16 one, uh, under-18s. Because those two under-16 teams are now too old for under-16s, obviously, and under-17s. But you're merging three teams, you know, and it's difficult to do. It's three sets of personalities, you know, and you've got... Girls who are turning 18 and girls who are just leaving high school, mm -hmm. the gap. So yeah. you're not only emerging different lifestyles, you emerge different ages, uh, different styles of coaching, how they've been coached. They, it's massive that. And as a group, you've got to find how each individual ticks. You know, and we've, we, we have we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where we sit and we talk with the girls and we, we, we've sat with all our girls and our team, what they want to do after basketball. You know, some one wants to be a vet, one wants to be a chef, one, you know, so... Uh, some of them want to play. So we're trying to put in the process right now. Okay, if we can start it now, they're with us for two years. You know, this, we've got 10, 10, nine or 10 first years. So those first years we've looked at this year and gone, okay, what do you want? You don't have to know what you're going to do, by the way. You yeah. don't actually need to because that's ridiculous pressure. But have you got a thought process yet? Okay, so you've got a thought process. 
now we know that and we'll check in every you know we're checking all the time with them because we see every week but you know has that changed how has that changed what can we do to help you know can we start finding internships for you can we start doing this it's bigger than basketball you know as coaches we'll take care of your basketball side you know we have a great link with mmu snc is covered the dice program's brilliant you know we have all these links you know we have such a great academy we have housing uh, we have all our social media everything's taken care of and um, so now we've got focus on right okay let's focus on the person let's focus on their well-being their confidence what makes them tick what they want out of our program and i went one of the girls straight away i said what do you want out of the program and she went to talk about listen do not say get better at basketball obviously that's why you're here i know that and she just she started laughing uh, and she was oh well you know i just want as a person i want to be able to communicate more and she was dead honest she went i just want to be able to communicate more. obviously the basketball side she went uh, I want to kind of find my voice. I thought it was a really mature response. Yeah. Um, so I was, okay, well, how, you know, how does that look like? Those type of conversations where this year, and they all sit with us now and they go, we just feel like we can just talk to you and we're open and we, we feel really comfortable, transparent with everything. And now the parents aren't really involved as much now. So the, and that's what we wanted. So, the, so you, can't, you can't skip anything. Now, don't get me wrong, if it's a welfare or you're injured, yeah. then you've got to speak to, and we have a fantastic welfare team. Uh, we have Morag who runs that. She, she it's her job in real life as well. Real life, like it's like it's a film <laughs> cartoon. Uh, she she's phenomenal with that, um, and the girls feel so at ease with her. We have Phil who manages it all, then us as directors and coaches. So we've got all these integral parts together now, you know. So everything's looked after, and then we want to put the girls in the center of that and go. You now find the voice to talk to us about anything. If you don't want to talk to me, talk to me assistant, which works really well because you can play yeah. that devil's advocate, you yeah. know, where you've got that balance where he's been a head coach. I can, he'll be dead honest with you. He's been the loudest coach in the country. He's very animated. This year, he's got a new role for us, which he's loving and he's embracing. He's fantastic at. Um, and then you've got, obviously, myself, who you can come to and talk. But, like, you know, sometimes you always don't want to talk to the head coach. You know, yeah. you've got the welfare officer and then you've got Phil. Uh, and I think this year, so far, it's just, it's been a breeze. You know, everyone's doing the job. Uh, and we, we look, we're just looking, you know, we're, we're looking ahead with all these things we're doing. We've got our under-16s coming through next year. And most of them have already committed to us. You know, they said they want to play under us, the way we coach, the way we are structured, the way we're organised, what we offer as a club. And like I said, that's amazing. that's the top thing. Going from your academics, like we yeah. spoke about, to your welfare to your best interest to help him with your UCAS points for uni. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, to, to to the little things like me and Phil always say, if you're willing to coach for us for a year, we'll pay for your level ones and two. And you just give back in the community. That puts you on a new path. You know, can, can you referee? And we always say whatever you're willing to commit, we're going to give back mm -hmm. twofold. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um and it, those are the type of things we really need. And then we're taking another step. I don't know if you know we're looking to go Portugal. So we've got uh, we've got a big we've got a big grant, big funding, and we want to take the the boys' academy, and the girls' academy to a Portugal trip uh, every year, okay. two weeks to Portugal. So we go we go to Sun Life Academy, uh, we train for two weeks as coaches. We're on the court with them, training them. We get to play uh, teams from Portugal. They get to have the experience of of, of, of a European academy, yeah. you know. And, and and again, we're building that link with them. I spoke to you before. We already have a link with the Combine Academy. We want to start doing some AAU tournaments. We want to start taking my teams out there, you know, from youth all the way to academy. We want to provide as much experience and knowledge as we can to these girls. And, and you know, and afterwards as coaches, once they've left us, and if they do leave us, we want to be in, in that position where we go, have we helped the girls fulfill their potential on and off the court? Have they enjoyed the time with us? Have they gained experience? And are we going to have this relationship long term? Yeah. And that's a fantastic me, thing to, to be building, to be a part of, especially such a you know, an established basketball city and academy such as Manchester. Absolutely. You know, and that, that's definitely where we're at. Uh, we've got a huge amount of talent coming through. We already have some GB players on our programme. We've got more coming through, more are committed. And, and there's, I know there's already a couple of players who have reached out from other places who, you know, who are interested uh, with us. And I think, you know, the more we can build and keep adding, uh, it adds values to girls' basketball. Like I said, I'm kind of new. I'm new on the block with girls' basketball. Uh, that's why I brought in Aki as well. You know, he has been around a girls' basketball. He's coached it. It is different. Um, so bring it, for me, I had to be box clever and go, I need some experience. He's a great friend anyway. He's been one of my best mates for a long time. But I need someone as well with a bit of pedigree. 
So you come in, you know, um, and then, you know, we need as well, we need to be challenging each other, you know, at practice, off the court, you know, am I getting better as a coach? Is he getting better as a coach? You know, we're not, make sure we're not becoming stale. You know, yeah. little things like that. What can we continuously add? Uh, again, you know, our gym's being refurbished. 160 grand gym upstairs. So our s c is going to be at home. We have house. Yeah, I, I know. Right? I'm starting not going to know about my pay rise. So I think if this is going on, it's going on here. You know? So <laughs> exactly, exactly. So we have, we have. You know, if you look at the academy in general, all those levels of potentially you can play it as a player. We have s &C. we have your best academics and uh, that cover their interest. And the funny thing in this year, a lot of girls don't go to Loretto. A lot of the boys do. My team's kind of spread, which makes it a bit harder for me. But we're still in contact with those colleges and those teachers to make sure they're on top of their academics. You know, I believe it's those little things. What It's not, not something you're trying to do just to, to show off or prove. Yeah. I think that's when you care. That's when you care about people. Yeah, it's a part of it, isn't it? It's it should, yeah, it should be, you know. And it for me again, it's a new learning process, you know. And now I'm involved more heavily with the academics, where in the past it's been SATs or, you know, it's only been kind of a small portion. Now it's now it's a two year program, you know. And then we we, we work with Steve Vere as well, which I know you guys probably know uh, Steve Vere, who he he does. Um, uh, with, with the women's program, recruiting women and, and trying to get girls to the states, we've linked with them again. That's a that's a great um, that's top of massive, yeah, yeah. It's Phil Phil Gordos again. You know, reached out to him again. That's it's Phil. You know, just being 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 Phil, going knocking on the door and saying, "Hey, Steve, you know, we want to create a link with you where our girls could feel comfortable." And we've already sat down with other girls, like I said before, who've some of them want to go to the states. Some of the first years, so we're going right. Well, let's let, let, let's uh, let's get uh, reach out to him now, so you have two years with him. You know, these are the type of things we're offering. I've got two Go real quick questions for you, if that's all right. Uh, yeah. First off, I've coached girls and boys, not at the standard, not at the level that you have, though, you know, some, some talented players there at the sports I've coached. Yeah. What is the big difference that you find between the two? Girls, listen. Yes. Because, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to by going, girls, listen, how good is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Girls, uh, not no, not all the time, but yeah, this we're, we're, we're blessed with this group this year, particularly. Um, I think for the girl, girls and boys, I think um, tactically at times, is a, obviously there's a massive difference because when you coach as a coach, there's certain offenses, defenses you run, and uh, you know at girls level, some teams aren't that athletic; they're not as big, not as quick, not as strong. So those defenses don't always fit, or offenses don't always fit. So as a coach, you've got to adjust with that. The pace of the game. The girls, I think it's a lot more. There's a lot. It's a lot more methodical. It's a lot more fundamental. It's not as explosive. So yeah, I think from a coaching point of view, you probably do more coaching. You know, because you have to find those intricate details. You know, and I think that's what separates um, a, a lot of the coaching with that. Uh, with the boys, it is quick, aggressive, um, high tempo. So with that, you know, you, you can kind of run a, a, a quite a easy offensive structure at times because they, they play at that pace. Uh, I think with girls, uh, particularly because there's not always been great girls coaching in the country, and I think it, it is catching up now and getting better. I think with the, with that standard now, uh, for me as a coach, in the past, I used to hate, I, I, I never really got it anywhere and stuff, but yeah, but the girls remember, you don't coach them like that. I'm like, I don't really like that. I don't really get why you're saying that because you're, you're implying that they can't do that. And I don't believe that, you know, we've, I don't, we've noticed we played a boys team this year on the 16 spinners teams. About six foot two, six foot three, beaten by six. You know, we're beating boys teams. So, you know, that that's out the window. You know, that it's not a thing. But I think, you know, you, the, the size, obviously, the boys are normally a lot bigger. It's stronger, athletic. And that's just that's just the way it is, you know. That, that That's fine. But I think the girls, listen, I think the, guy, the girls will buy into stuff quicker as well. Yeah, yeah. With boys basketball, they have a lot of, yeah, but it's still my ball, you know, type of attitude. They're, well, no, where girls go, right, okay, this is what the coach wants, you know. I find there's been a, a bit more of a buy-in with that. Um, and it's been different. Like I said, it was really different for me because it is it is a change. And there's certain things I, I, I put in my my program, my structure, how I like to I like to use my skill development into um, kind of small-sided games development into then our, our offensive structure. And I have like a platform where I coach. Um, I found it. Girls have probably bought into that a lot more than some of the boys because the boys go, I don't want to do that bit. I want to go from here to here, yeah. you know, and with these girls have been really, really patient with it. 
Uh, and it's paying off now. You've played four, we've won four, you know, in pre-season games, you know. And we said we're really young as well. So that's a really good state. You know, 10 for first years. And I said this 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 year will be very interesting for us because under 18s, we've got five second years, everyone first years. But in WEBL, a lot of them are under 19. So we're two years away, really. Yeah. So I said for us, it's going to be interesting this year because we could play Sheffield, for instance, on a Saturday. Win or lose. Say we win by 20. And then play Sheffield in WEBL on Wednesday. And they could have a brand new starting five because they're under 19. So for us as coaches, scouting, changing, telling these young girls that, you know, from a mental preparation, but this isn't the same team you're playing three days ago. That's going to be an interest. And that's new for me because I've always been able to scout the same team. You know, bar maybe one or two players just through the year. Now when you start it, you can potentially scout a new starting five. Yeah. So yeah, that that definitely I'd, I'd say the girls listen, I say you're more methodical, you can coach. Um I'd say they probably like each other a bit more as well. <laughs> boys uh, yeah, yeah, they like each other a little bit more. Some of the boys' programs I've coached have really gone like there's a there's a click here of three, four, and then it's just kind of like, you know, yeah. with that. Um, but I enjoy both. I really do enjoy both, and it's a great new experience for me. I want a coach at a high, uh, a really top high level. That's either with Mystics here, staying long haul because we keep moving up the ranks, or a look, you know, or, or another top top program, uh, women's or, or men's for me. So just conscious of time because it's been great, but we don't want to take up too much more of your time. Yeah, yeah. We might have to come back on, tell us about how your your, your girls are doing. Um, yeah, yeah. Mystics chat. Later on. So uh, just one couple final questions, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Yep, yeah, yeah, um, cool. So what, uh, what is the best piece of advice that you could give to a, a new coach coming in that's going to, you know, maybe go through some of the same experiences as you? Really, really good question. I would say, first of all, um, understand that you're going to have to get your, earn your stripes. You know, don't be scared of uh, volunteer work. Don't be scared of coaching different age groups. Uh, really get involved, you know, get involved at every age group. You know, don't think you're too good to coach at an age group. I coach from... Um, you know, from like you know, from kids in reception all the way up to America. I've coached you, know, I've been involved with NBA practices, I've been involved with practice. So, don't ever think you're too good to coach at any level. Always be willing, um, knock on the door. You know, uh, you can never look a fool when you're asking questions. You know, if you're around the right program, I always say to my coaches, there's never a stupid question. Ask me, you know, what is it? Anything about it, you know, just, 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 just put yourself out there, you know, research enough, learn enough, okay. And then network. I think network's a really underrated thing within the coaching community. I think you network uh, with coaches for opportunities. Um, and then my last one, when it comes actually down to the to coaching, uh, the devil's in the detail. Don't skip details. Find out what, if you're brand new through the door, find out what like what you like coaching. So say you're, say I've got Ebony this year and she comes in. What do you like coaching, Ebony? Well, I like coaching ball handling. Let's start there then. And now let's try to give you some ideas why you like it and what we can do next. You know, then let's start to build through it. You know, do what you like first and let's build on all the stuff around it. Don't try and think you need to know everything because no coach does. That's the whole point of growth and learning. Uh, and I said devil's in the detail. If you do like ball handling, go through your details, you know, each bit. And then from there, you'll, and then and uh, from there, make sure you do this, which is really important, which I think is the technique what needs to be done more in coaching, reflection. I, I used to have a voice recorder in the States and my coaches and we'd just fire ideas on it. And then at the end of the week, we'd listen to our ideas. Some of it, it was like we were drunk in a in a pub, some of it. But some of it was, some of it's great. You go, ah, yes, okay, that reflection, what I did right and wrong, and then go from there again. Okay, that's great. Um, and then just one final question. So if people are interested in sort of following the Mystics youth teams, want to get involved, where can they go? Who can they speak to? Is it stuff on uh, social media? Loads of social media, so we're on every platform you can think of. Uh, Manchester Basketball, Ma Manchester Magic, and Mystics Basketball Academy on Google. It'll come up with our website. We have Instagram. We have uh, Manchester Mystics uh, Instagram, Manchester Magic Instagram. Uh, we have Manchester uh, Academy Basketball Instagram on there. We have WW, uh, WBBL Mystics, as you guys uh, fully well know, uh, on on Facebook with the same. And uh, my advice to people: be get involved as much as you can. You know, learn about us, do some research. I have my own social media. Uh, if people want to reach out and discuss any topics with me as well, by all means, I'm always open to that, to talk to people. I think it's great that we're all networking. Um, and yeah, that would be my, my kind of last one. Paul. 
Uh, I'm on Instagram. It's Paul Cantwell one. Uh, no, sorry, Paul Cantwell 07 on Instagram. Uh, if anyone wants my email address to send stuff over, it's paulcantwell1 at hotmail.com. But my Instagram is paulcantwell07. That's great. And Darren, Don't just worry. remind me, I've forgotten the most important question. What is your condiment of the year? Oh, give me give me some ideas. Who said some good stuff so far? So Robin so Love when Frank's Buffalo Hot Wings, uh, hot sauce. That right. has probably been like the most exciting answer. Lots of ketchup, you know, ketchup, Ayo. for example. Condiment of, of the year. Condiment of the year. Mm, you know, it's been tough. You know what? Because I had a time off. Might not be a proper condiment. I've been cooking a lot of steak with red wine. <laughs> yeah, so I've been yeah. doing a little, a little bit of that. I'd probably say, though, I do like, uh, I, do, I do love hot sauce myself, but I use a lot of pesto in my food as well. Do like, like, that's, that's in France. Pesto we can go with. Kaz, yeah, yeah. I rule pesto is in, you say? Yeah. Yes, it's in. Wine's probably out. Right, yeah. okay, pesto will go with, yeah, we'll go with that. that. Process, but pesto, slap that on, yeah. Fine, <laughs> beautiful. But, well, guys, listen, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate yeah, it. You. you guys are doing a fantastic job. And listen, if you need anything of me, like, let's just keep the content. Let's just keep this rolling. You guys keep putting that content out there, what everyone needs to see. Uh, I'm really happy you guys are, 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 are doing it. Your chemistry is great. Uh, I just keep it flowing, guys. And uh, listen, have a great Christmas, and I wish you guys all the best. Thank you, Paul. Great. Yourself as well. So we take care, guys. Bye now. So that was Paul's uh, basketball journey. What a fascinating career he's had so far, and loads of information on the Mystics, the youth teams. If you want to get involved, get in touch with him. Find him on social media. We'll be following the progress of the Mystics seniors under 18s this season as they start their WEABL league. Um, so yeah, lots of great stuff to come. And don't forget to catch us on a Thursday for the Kaz and Daz show live where we've got all your women's basketball news, everything going on. Thank you. Bye.